everyone for coming. Uh, we'll have now a workshop on the formal verification of smart contracts. And maybe before you jump into the topic, so how many people have done any formal verification of contracts so far? Maybe just raise the hands. So very few. So I guess all the remaining ones got attracted by the last part. That, that's supposed to be easy. <laughs> and uh, hopefully by the end of this workshop, everybody manages to you will have a hands-on hands -on exercise and everybody should be able to verify some form of properties on contracts. Uh, so the people that will be doing the workshop, uh, we have uh, Dimitar there, uh, he's a PhD student, TDA is uh, joining Chain Security now, uh, background in uh, formal verification and program analysis. Then we have also Anton Permenev, <coughs> so he's the lead developer of the verifier that we'll be using today in the workshop. Uh, also Hubert, who is sitting back there, CTO of Chain Security and uh, myself as well. So who we are? We are Chain Security. Uh, we are a spin-off from ETH Zurich. ETH, the university, not the foundation, uh, based in uh, Zurich, Switzerland. And uh, we focus on the blockchain security. We have worked with uh, many blockchain projects so far. We have done over 80 audits. Uh, not only smart contract audits, but also protocol audits, platform audits, uh, as well as uh, a couple of very visible EIPs. I think many people are recognize the chain security name from uh, you know some of those EIPs that we have reviewed in the past. And uh, so yeah, we also have we're doing quite a few R&D security products with platforms such as Ethereum Foundation, Polkadot, Zilliqa, and a few other blockchains, where we focus on building security tools, you know, tools for finding bugs as well and, and as well as uh, formal verification tools for for these platforms. All right, so as far, to do our work, we have done quite a couple of uh, systems so far. So I have listed some of those, so, so some of them on, the, on uh, this slide here. And so this system aims to achieve different goals. We typically combine techniques from various different domains, such as uh, static analysis, dynamic analysis. We also use quite a lot of uh, data-driven techniques for machine learning to, uh, to, you know, to build these systems. So some of you are probably familiar with uh, Securify. This was the first system that we built back in 2017. Uh, it's a system for finding generic vulnerabilities in smart contracts. Um, and uh, yeah, so that uh, was basically addressing all these bugs that were popping up regularly every couple of weeks in 2017 uh, in all these uh, you know, parity wallets and many other contracts. So this is what that system was addressing. And so this system, along with other systems, I think they made a difference in the sense that 2018 we actually saw much fewer hacks because of such generic, like really simple boxing contracts. So another system we have built is um, we have a fuzzing system that addresses the problem of ensuring functional correctness. So we're going to talk a little bit more about what functional correct correctness actually means. And uh, we have a fuzzing system that essentially generates transactions and try, tries to find violations of the uh, specific security properties that we're trying to, to check for, for the smart contracts. And the main system that we will be talking about today is the Verex system, which is um, the first automated verifier for, uh, for verifying smart contracts. Uh, this, we have a demo on uh, Verex.ch. We have set up a few other instances of this uh, system that we will be using for the exercise uh, uh, later today. And for people that are interested really in depth on how that system works, what guarantees it provides, so we also have a research paper which will appear at the IEEE Symposium on Security and, and Privacy. So that's one of the main security conferences, uh, one of the main academic security conferences. So if you go on our webpage, chainsecurity.com, and go to research, you can download the PDF and uh, read all the details about the, the verification technique that is uh, being used in that system. All right. So before we actually do, I will, you know, go into the hands-on um, exercises, uh, it's important also to mention why are we actually doing this. And the main reason is that, I mean, when I initially asked how many people have verified contracts, I think there were about two, three hands. And the reason this is is that, you know, formal verification used to be this very, difficult, time-consuming task where you have to be really an expert in formal verification, have a PhD in uh, logics and so on to, to, uh, to prove that the contract is correct. And uh, if we are to make formal verification mainstream, you know, a lot of developers also adopting that approach, 
then you have to be building a system. We have to be building systems that allow people without this background to write functional specifications and prove the contracts correct. And that's exactly what uh, this very 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 far aims to do. Um, so it eliminates this need to know in-depth knowledge of formal verification and takes down. This reduces also significantly the verification time um, because, uh, as we will see, it's really not a very hard task to uh, to, to verify contracts uh, with such systems. So with such a system, if you take something like a standard ERC20 token, which we'll look in depth in the exercise, you can literally do a full formal verification for all the main properties you would care about a token in a, in a matter of a couple of hours and be done with, uh, with the verification effort. So I have listed here some of some, some problems that we have verified. We have more on our main web page, jsecurity.com uh, slash audits, where you can find some of, some of these reports where we have done <coughs> proper full verification of those. All right, so the workshop will continue as follows. So uh, we'll start with some very more high level introduction to what functional correctness means and uh, why is it challenging to formally verify properties with uh, functional properties and uh, what are different techniques, that's, uh, different tools that are introduced in that space, what, how they different terms of guarantees. Then, so also we'll cover here, of course, the, 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 the Varex system. And then in the second half, we'll switch to a hands-on exercise where Dimitar will uh, talk, uh, walk you through how do we specify properties and verify them with, uh, with a verifier like Varex. And uh, so we'll also have uh, many other pe people from the chain security team back there. So they will be assisting you while, uh, while doing this exercise. And then in the last part, depending on time, we'll try to get into some more detail about the actual verification methods and how this is being automated by the Varex verifier. All right? So let's get started. And um, functional correctness. So what is functional correctness? So usually when people think about security tools, there are these kind of tools where you just paste the codes and then they show you a bunch of vulnerabilities that are found. So this is not what we're talking about here. So we're not looking for generic vulnerabilities. We're talking about functional correctness. And what this means is that uh, when the, the problem of functional correctness has two parts. So one is you have the smart contract that you want to prove uh, that you, you want to you wanna make sure it's correct. And then the second piece of information that you need is the functional specification of the smart contract. So what the functional specification is that this is the thing that this defines what is, what is the intended correct behavior of that smart contract. Okay. So to make this a little bit more concrete, uh, here on the left, imagine you have a smart contract, a typical ERC20 contract. <coughs> so you have all the standard fields like balances, total supply, owner, a couple of functions that would allow users to, to transact with the contract. And then the functional specification typically consists of requirements such as the sum of all balances equals the total supply. Okay, so intuitively this specification says that uh, all the tokens are assigned to users. Somehow there are no missing tokens unassigned to, you know, not, not, not assigned to any user. Another common example is that uh, often tokens are mintable, meaning that you can increase and issue more tokens. And often you want to ensure that only certain users can uh, exercise this functionality and you want to make sure that if the total supply increases, then that was triggered by a transaction issued by the owner of the contract. Okay? And then typically you would have a huge list of those requirements that you would have to, you would have to check that whatever the implementation of these functions is, it is correct with respect to these functional requirements. Okay? So technically how, does, how do we actually check that uh, the, the code is correct, and they're roughly speaking two steps. So the first step is, well, to essentially transform this English description of correct behavior into something that's, uh, to take them down, at the, to specify them at the level of the source code, okay? So for instance, if we take the first requirement that says that the sum of balances has to be equal to the total supply, then this is written in the specification language that we'll be using later in the exercise, so the very specification language. And this is how it would look in the actual specification language, so fairly intuitive. There's a set, some keyword, point to the mapping that we're trying to sum, and then it, we have equality with the total supply. Okay, so that's step number one, it's inevitable. You know, you have to be able to trans formally state what the property means 
And uh, once we have formalized it, then if we have a particular state of the smart contract, then we can check the, whether this property holds or not. All right. So for instance, if we look at a state where we have two users having balance 50 each, and we have total supply 100, then the property holds. That's, that's what it says. And here would be an example where the property doesn't hold, because the sum of these two balances actually exceeds the total balance specified in the contract. OK, is this clear? So that's step number one, define the property. Step number two is to actually check that this property holds for all possible states that your contract could reach. Okay? Now what does this again technically mean? Well, once you deploy the smart contract on the blockchain, it is always initialized by the deployment script. So it would end up in being some specific initial state. So that's what this state is, and you would have to make sure that the property holds there. So for instance, you deploy and then for that initial state, the sum of balances will have to be equal to the total supply. Okay, that's one. Then the next thing is that once deployed, the users would send, would send a transaction to the smart contract and each transaction would modify the state of the smart contract. So they can, for example, submit a mint transaction with different, you know, different values as arguments and so on. And Let's be a little bit more precise what these arrows and boxes here represent. So what these boxes represent is the actual state of the contract and the arrows are the transitions that are triggered by the transactions submitted by the users. And how are, how is, how are these transitions defined? This is defined by the implementation of the, of the functions in the contract. So for example, if we have here, the initial, we start from a state where total supply is 100, we have an owner user with address X10, and then we have two users with balance as uh, 50 tokens each. And then mint function is defined such that it would increment the total supply by the number of tokens we want to, to mint. And then it would assign the new tokens to the, to, the owner, to the owner of the contract. So here, if we have this mint 100 tokens issued by the user, Basically, the total supply would be incremented as defined by the function, and then the balance of the owner who has address 0x10 would be incremented from 50 to also 100, because that's how many additional tokens we're issuing. Okay? So that's what these arrows here mean. All right. So here comes immediately the first Im uh, immediate challenge when we talk about functional correctness, is that even if we want to consider whether the property would hold after one single transaction, after the first transaction sent to the contract, that already gives you so many different transactions that you could uh, that could be that would have to be accounted for that it becomes infeasible to brute force. So you, it's not possible to enumerate these transactions and to actually check that in all these states the property will always hold. Okay, so that's challenge number one, and we cannot stop here because after the first transactions the user would submit second, third, and so on transaction. And in fact, there's not a, not a predefined bound on how many transactions this contract would process in its lifetime. So we would have to consider an unbounded number of transactions if we are to formally verify that this property would always hold. Okay, so there are two fundamental challenges here. All right, so let's very quickly go over what are different techniques that could be used to address this problem of checking these formal properties and how they differ in terms of guarantees. And uh, so I ordered the basic on reliability. So starting from least reliable, going towards uh, more, rela more reliable techniques. Well, the bottom we have the manual review. So always a human can look at the codes, understand what it does, and try to find violations. So this is essentially penetration testing. We have the property and try to try to, to, to hack the contracts. And the disadvantages here are fairly well known. So this is a time-consuming problem, even if you have, especially if you have big contracts. That's would take a while for for the security expert to understand exactly how this thing, how uh, how the functionality of the contract is. Then let's move over to more automated techniques. So next level would be to do some form of automated testing, and then primarily in general for software, but also in the space of contracts, two techniques for testing contracts. So one is based on fuzzing, and the second major technique is uh, tools based on symbolic execution. So let's briefly see what, this, what, what these techniques would do to this problem of, uh, of checking functional correctness. And so starting for, with fuzzing, 
here's basically what's happening. So fuzzing is a testing technique where a fuzzer would generate random transactions, and then it would execute the transactions on the contract, and uh, by doing so, it, the fuzzer would observe different, different states of the smart contract. All right? And by doing so, we can, for all the states that have been observed after processing these transactions that we generate, we could check whether the property is violated or not. If it happens that we reach a state where you get a violation, then the fuzzer could also return that sequence of transaction that triggered the violation, and the developer could see, you know, reproduce the bug and try to fix it. There are many, many fuzzers that have been deployed that, that are available online that do exactly this, this, this thing. The challenge here typically is how to generate transactions in a smart way so you get very high coverage over, at least a very high code coverage over the contract, which is already pretty challenging in contracts which tend to be very stateful, have complex preconditions on the transactions and so on. So what fuzzing will not give you, it will not give you this full guarantee, that's why it's a testing technique, because inevitably there will be some states that you would not, not observe simply because the fuzzer did not generate that specific sequence of transaction that would uh, transition the contract to that state. So it's a testing technique essentially. Now, symbolic execution does something different. Symbolic execution, the technique that it is based on this uh, symbolic execution technique, it simply would not scale to reason about such depth of transaction. So typically if you use a symbolic, uh, symbolic tool, you would give it a timeout. So it would run for maybe 30 minutes, one hour, and then you would stop and then it would reach certain depth. So it is better at this kind of uh, breadth exploration, and, but if the bugs are hidden deeper, like after five, ten transactions, which could happen even in simple contracts like crowd sales where you have to transition to, for example, to some refund phase where you could exercise the refund functionality. So these typically tend to be somewhere lower that are harder to explore with symbolic tools. So I have listed here some of the open tools that are available that, uh, to do this. Okay? Is this clear so far? Uh, if there are any questions, just raise your hand and then we can also go into a bit more detail. All right, so that's testing. And then the highest level would be the, the formal verification, what this uh, workshop would be about. And this is really the point where you have a flip from testing to full verification, meaning that you could actually prove that this property for whatever sequence of transactions the user would make, it would always hold, no matter what. Okay, so there's a major flip that happens at that point. All right? Now, so just visually what this means is that you would cover all possible states essentially, and if you would check all of them, and if you check mark all of them, you have this full guarantee. All right? So that's, that's what the variant system does and uh, you will be using it soon. And the input to that system is, uh, uh, as we saw, the, the smart contracts, as well as the specification, because we're dealing with functional correctness here. And the main thing, of that, what, the main thing that Varex does is it, it fully automates this process of, uh, uh, fully automates the process of verifying in the sense that it's, if it successfully verifies the property, it, can gar it guarantees that it is, for, it is fully verified. And if it fails to verify the property, then it doesn't give a guarantee whether the property doesn't hold or not. Okay? So it could be that you have to help a little bit the tool to actually verify the property. Or it could be that the property is violated and then you have to fix the contract. So we'll see some examples on the, during the, the technical exercise later. All right, so to give you a bit of a, so something that we actually spent quite some time is to ensure that uh, Varex has a very intuitive and easy to use specification language. Because that typically is one of the bottleneck when we talk about fu uh, functional correctness. Because again, to use functional correctness, in addition to the contract, you have to write down what the contract is supposed to do. And if this is very hard and tedious to specify, you, you, know, you would end up not, not really using the system. So I will give a few examples of um, specifications that uh, we have seen to very frequently appear in real world smart contracts. So this is something we just observed during audits and verifying contracts. And so this is, a, this, is, this is literally what the specifications are. So you don't have to write some elaborate scripts or something very complicated to formally state a property. So common properties are things like access control, 
where you want to ensure that certain functions can be invoked by particular users. For instance, he's saying that in always in the contract, if there was a transaction to deposit, then that was that transaction was made by the owner of the contract. Another common pattern that we observe is that uh, very often in, it's not about who is sending a transaction, but it won't, in, in what state the contract is. So for instance, if, here we say that uh, if the current time exceeds the refund time by a week, then users are never, no longer allowed to submit refund transactions. So, um, Yes, state machine properties as, as well. So again, contracts are very stateful. There's explicit state variables that define how the states, how the contract can transition into different states. So you have to make sure that these transitions are in code, uh, that are implemented correctly in the contract. We saw that example earlier as well. So we have some over, um, basically aggregations over mappings and arrays are also tend to be pretty common. So that's, uh, we have, added these explicit keywords in the language to allow users to, to write these properties. And another common pattern is that, so typically if you have a, a project, it's, you don't implement the full product in one contract, but in several contracts. And often there are certain invariants, that, so some sort of dependencies that are, exist between the contracts, and there are properties that capture these dependencies, so you have to verify that they are implemented uh, correctly in the contracts. Okay, so. Again, you will be writing some of these, some of these uh, specifications soon. A bit more technically, the, for um, like people interested in logic, so the specification language is actually based on uh, something, on a fragment of temporal logic, which is very well studied uh, specification language. It goes back decades of research in this, so it has very well understood complexities and uh, expressivity and so on. All right. So I will not go into depth on how, how the verifier actually works, uh, but intuitively it combines two techniques. One technique is it does use this symbolic execution technique, which is very good at handling dealing with many different art, concrete values that you could submit in transactions. And then it's to deal with the unbounded depth that uh, users would submit, it uses something called predicate abstraction that allows it to fully capture all the possible, like this very large unbounded tree to capture it with some finite representation. So depending on time, we may get also you know, into more details about that technique. All right, so that was the high level intro. And uh, now we're going to transition into the actual exercise on the, yeah, how to use Varex and to uh, specify these properties. So I'll hand over to Mitko who will introduce the examples. Yes. Okay, hi, I, I'm Mitko. Yes, and now we continue with the kind of small exercise of how to use Varex. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions at any time, just raise your hand, just speak, and uh, we, we can answer the questions. Uh, the goal here is to, to make the exercise more interactive and not so kind of formal. Okay. Uh, so, so the first step in any kind of formal verification uh, is to actually specify the properties informally. Uh, this means that you specify them in natural language. Whether it's English or some other language, uh, you just need to have some clarity over what this smart contract wants to do, right? And in this exercise, we'll look at uh, two main contracts. Uh, one is ERC20 token, and the other is kind of standard crowd sale, of course simplified because we don't have uh, too much time. Okay, so first we'll go over specifying functional requirements informally, right? And we, we go, this is kind of a fragment of ERC20 interface. <coughs> and for, for those who kind of are not so familiar with it, uh, the, the contract has, a, let's say, three main functions. One is total supply, how many tokens are in circulation. The other is balance of, you can query how much uh, tokens given address or account has. And the actual main function here is the transfer function, where, where the sender of the transaction right, can transfer some tokens from its own account to the recipient. So we have the address of the recipient's account and some amount of ether or any tokens, sorry, not ether, just tokens that want to transfer, right? And 
Now, whenever we are specifying uh, behavior of contracts, we do it over the contract and not over the interface. So here are the relevant parts of the actual contract, right? So the functions we have, the balance, the, the total supply and balance, become fields of the contract, right? So these are now private fields, <coughs> and we have total supply and a mapping, which says for every address or account, how many tokens this address or account possesses, right? So this one is just uh, an integer, and this is a mapping from addresses to integers, right? And here we have some specification of function transfer. Now, when we're thinking about the contract, or just specifying its, its correctness, we, at least as a principle, when I, I'm doing these things, I never look at, into the implementation, right? So for me, the contract is a black box, and that's why I specifically omitted the body of the transfer function, right? So now the goal is to just come up with a couple of properties, hopefully full set of properties that specify the whole behavior of the contract. Okay, good. So, let's do this a little bit more interactive. Uh, first property is on me, right? So, we already saw it actually. And it says, just informally, in English, total supply always equals the sum of balances, right? So, this kind of specifies uh, an invariant, well, invariant meaning that it holds at all states of your contract, uh, something that you would like to hold, right? And now we need to specify invariance about the transfer function, right? So suppose you start the transaction with a given transfer function, you have uh, a specific recipient and a specific amount. And what would be the usual case of transfer? So how it would look like? Yes. So I would say the uh, uh, amount on the, of the sender needs to decrease. The amount of the recipients needs to increase by the amount. The balance of the uh, recipient needs to increase the amount, and the total supply is not allowed to change. The total supply is not allowed to change. Yes, you're right. Yes. So this is a very good requirement. We can elaborate a little bit more. So just to repeat, right? You decrease the senders. Uh, uh, account by the given amount, you increase the recipient's account by the given amount, and total supply should remain the same, right? But one thing, for example, that we omitted is that, uh, so we said the total supply should be the same, but this transfer could have transferred tokens from another account, right? So we didn't specify this. So what we did is a partial specification, right? So in addition to that, we need to specify that all other accounts remain unchanged, right? It's not just the total supply. And as a consequence, the total supply will also remain unchanged, right? Okay. So we also do this in uh, the case the sender's account has sufficient funds, right? Sufficient amount of tokens. If it doesn't have, the function should not do anything, right? So the first case, a little bit more elaborately, right, is if the message sender is not equal to the recipient, right, otherwise you don't have anything to do, and there is sufficient amount of tokens in the balance of the message sender, then the message sender's account or balance should be decreased amount, the balance of the recipient should be increased by the given amount, and all remaining balances should be made unchanged, right? This is kind of a fairly straightforward informal specification. Right? So what would be the remaining case? So we have one more case to do here. Any clue? Number of balances should be the same as number of addresses? Number of balances? I mean the yes, yes, you, you're correct. Number of balances should be the same as number of addresses. This is kind of implicitly assumed, so if we go back a little, this is kind of implicitly assumed. We have this mapping. It, it kind of, you can think of it, containing account for everybody, every possible address in the world. It's a very large amount, all the possible addresses. It's really kind of the Ethereum kind of language, uh, the security language takes care of this. Yes. But this is a, a correct thing, yes. Uh, then it's just the negation of the condition. So message sender is recipient or the balances is less than the amount. Exactly, yes. So what we do is we consider the alternative case, right? So we have this if here. Alternative is to logically negate the condition in the if. 
which means that if the message sender is the recipient or the balances are not sufficient, right? All balances should remain unmodified, right? Yes. You're not taking into account overflow at this point. Like, uh... I'm not taking into account overflow at this point. Yes, you are absolutely right. So, when you're doing specification, it's very easy to miss something. Well, also the same way as, as you program something. For example, here uh, it could happen that these conditions here are satisfied when overflow happens because we have modular arithmetic here, we're dealing only with addition and subtraction, everything works fine, even if you overflow something. And the problem is when you overflow something, the actual amount is not the amount you want. Yes. Is that in general you don't take into account overflow or just in this example? So in this example, I don't take it into account. Uh, so what you can do uh, with, with Varex is, depending on your property, you can specify in such a way that it would automatically fail to verify if overloads happen, right? But what we currently do with Varex is that we don't uh, explicitly check for overloads, right? You need to write your property in such a way that it fails even if there is an overload. Right? Uh, okay, and the other thing is you can think of the specification at the informal level as referring to actual integers where there is no overflow, right? This is kind of just the informal part. But when you go to actual formal verification, you cannot think of it this way, right? Okay. So this is informal requirements for ERC-20. Okay. Now let's go to something slightly more elaborate. So we have a crowd sale. And the crowd sale has a couple of fields, so the crowd cell contract, the amount of ether which is raised, the goal of ether which you want to raise, and the closing time of the crowd cell. And the behavior of the contract is that whenever somebody sends money through the invest function, right, this is a payable function, the crowd cell contract will deposit this money into the escrow, right? And when somebody invokes close and it's about time to get closed, right, after the close time has passed, then depending on this, we have two options. Either the goal was raised, in which case the beneficiary of the crowd sale can withdraw the money from the escrow, or the goal was not raised, in which case the investors can claim a refund for their actor, which put inside. And this logic should be realized in the escrow method. So here what you do have is mapping the deposits, how many uh, how much ether each other is deposited into the escrow, and the beneficiary who, in case of success, will receive all the money, right? So now let's, let's try to specify this again informally, right? So, uh, again, let's do the first one. So, the goal and close time always remain the same. Right, so, so this might look like a stupid informal requirement, but in, in solidity, these things can change, right? The speeds of your contract, these are stored in the storage. Potentially, they can change. So because of this, we need to be explicit about which things need to remain constant or which things uh, can change, right? So this is a requirement that is all, all often missed, and people can, yeah, tend to forget it. OK, other suggestions? Right, so, so just to implement kind of the, the logic that we informally describe now in informal language, right? No need to, to be very precise. Yes? Close only works if you pass the close time. Sorry? Close only will, will only work if you pass the close time. Close will only work if you pass the close time. Yes. And it goes way, like, or, so what does this mean? Close will only work if you pass the close time. Okay, so if now is larger than close time. Yeah. Uh, well, like if, if now is less than close time, call to close must be work. Must be unsuccessful. It must be unsuccessful. Yeah. Yes, yes. So you, you can specify it like this. Yeah. This is one option. Now let me see what the next next property I specify here is because yes, but maybe maybe it's it's something along the lines of close. So what does it say? 
assume if no, it's, it's something else, right? So, so, so uh, here, just for the sake of the, the workshop, uh, I have the properties fixed. So you are welcome to say any properties. I will not add them to the slides. Here will just work with some fixed set of properties. And property B here says that the sum of investor deposits equals the ether in escrow unless capital is successful, right? So this means that you cannot withdraw or change money from escrow <coughs> unless the account sale is successful, right? Okay, so let's see some, something more. Escrow never allows both withdrawing and claiming the difference. Right? So this was one of the requirements we wanted to specify. And more, more, yes, investors cannot claim refunds after crowd sale goal is reached. And maybe you, you can figure out what would be the complement of this, not complement, the complementary for the extra property needed to counterpart this, this behavior, yes. Um, beneficiary can withdraw after crowd sale. Beneficiary can only withdraw after crowd sale goal is reached. Yes, beneficiary can only withdraw unless crowd sale goal is reached. Oh, yeah, no. I just said the flip of that. Yeah. Okay, okay. Can only yes, withdraw yes. You can say something in many ways, so yes, but it's the same. So beneficiary cannot withdraw before crowd sale goal is reached. Right? So we have these five kind of properties. Now, this is most likely incomplete specification of, of the behavior of the crowd sale. So providing a full complete specification is kind of a difficult exercise. And whenever you're verifying your contracts, you don't need to do it, right? But this means that you should always keep in mind the possibility that you missed something, right? Okay, so now we have a bunch of properties. And what we can do is we can just attempt to formalize them and specify them in the Varex specification language and try to verify them. Okay, any questions? One question is, as you're going through the requirements, you, s you saw that um, if you go back to the specific uh, interface for the contract, uh, the crowd sale, there are three states, open, yes. success, and, and refund. refund. Yes. But there not there another state where the, you've reached the goal, it's closed, but the beneficiary hasn't gotten around to claiming the thing, so it's kind of pending. Is my, my my question is with regard to the interaction between this code and the specification? Do you go back and forth and change the this code based on your understanding of the specification? So, so if you're to develop the the contract together with the specification, yes, this is how it, it, it's going to do, to to happen, right? You, you, you do back and forth, right? You write your requirements. If you see that you missed something, you, you, you change the code. And maybe, on the other hand, you, you did something in the specification which is wrong, and the code reflects it correctly, so you need to change the specification. Uh, it's, so this process, you can miss something, for sure. Right? Yeah, because it seems like here there would be some kind of limbo state where there will be a limbo state, yes, yeah. absolutely. There will be a limbo state uh, once the close time has reached uh, and this close method was not called, right? The escrow will still be in an open state mm -hmm. and you cannot do anything, basically. You, this is right. the limbo state. Because maybe the beneficiary never gets around. Maybe they you know, got vaporized and that, you know, so it remains a limbo state forever. Uh, so, okay, so then you need to, to make a requirement that you can escape the limbo state. Right. You can need to make an extra requirement. As I said, the specification we listed is incomplete. So there is something else I need to tell. Uh, so what you said, you can escape the, the limbo state. This is called the liveness property. And Varex actually cannot verify liveness properties. They require different techniques. And what we focus on properties of this kind, which are called safety properties. Yes, but I will not get into much detail about this. Okay. Yes. But does this kind of a reverse? Shouldn't you have the formal requirement first before you write a contract? 
depends on your style how, how you develop the code, right? So some people prefer to write the code so they understand the problem domain better and then develop the specification. Some people try to develop the specification before they understand it. Okay. Also, if you're providing an audit service, you're not writing the code, you're, you're hired to audit. Yes, to, to write the spec, exactly. This is uh, what people in change like do. Yes, they, they don't touch the code. Or they give suggestions of how the code can be changed, but in general, yes, we do write specifications. Sometimes based on the code. Sometimes based on requirements given by the clients. Yes? <coughs> What about uh, investment fun uh, the function invest? Yes. After the goal is reached, should that be possible? To uh, whether you can invest after the goal is reached, uh, it should not be possible. It should not be possible to invest once the crowd sale ended in some way. So maybe we should have a. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. I said the specification is incomplete. Oh, okay. Right, right. So ideally, you'll get a complete specification, but this is kind of open-ended process. It requires some creativity. Okay, good. So, I just want, oh, so the, the whole point of this is to emphasize that before you start with formal specification, it's good to have informal one, right? Just to have a clue what you want to do. Good. So, okay. Let's move on very fine things with Varex. We try to formalize these properties in the specification language of Varex supports and see whether they verify or not. Okay. So now things get into the specification language. And <coughs> Varex is based on something called linear temporal logic. So this might sound scary, but it's something very natural. So let me try to just give a, a brief explanation. So maybe most of you are familiar with classical logic. This is our everyday logic that we use. And you can express formalized properties. For example, the age of Alice plus the age of Bob is zero, right? So classical logic defines the relations between individuals. In this case, the relation is that the sum of the two ages is zero, right? And how would you write this formally in classical logic? You say there exists some integer such that age of Alice plus the age of Bob is twice this integer, right? So kind of to say that things are even, right? This is classical logic. And temporal logic adds another dimension to this, which is time, right? So now things are not just statically laid out in a perfect ideal world, but we also have progress of time. And temporal logic allows us to define relations across states. So you have usually initial state in time point zero, then you have time point one, you have another state, and so on, and so on, and so on. And now you can define a relation between those states. And here we, we just, as an example of such a relation, it says it's always the case that the age of values is the age of both is zero, right? Sorry. So we just changed the property very slightly by adding the always kind of temporal operator to express this, this relation, which is across time now, not just within a single state, right? So you see that this, this this relation does not hold in the real world, right? It's, it cannot be always the case that ages are even. When somebody, the same increments the age, one guy increments the age, the, the sum will become old, right? So this is an example of property that does not hold, because it's not always the case that this happens. Unless they're twins. <laughs> Sorry? Unless they're twins. Unless they're twins. You're, or it's born on the same You're absolutely right. Yes, I forgot Depending about on this. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, I absolutely so yes, there are cases where this is, uh, can be true. Yes. Okay. So just to say what you're specifying with the temporal logic, what you do have is this model kind of. You, you specify properties of traces more formally, and each trace is a sequence of states, right? Uh, the index of the sequence gives you kind of discrete time. So time progresses from zero to infinity going in increments of one, right? So for example, this could be the zeroth state, or some people li like to count from one, we call it the first state. And this is the second state, this is the third state, right? So this is kind of what you're specifying in temporal logic. And each state, we can kind of divide into two worlds, or two parts. There are the constants inside the states, and the variables inside the state. And as an example, Alice, as a person, is a constant. 
which means that it, this object does not change across time. Alice remains Alice in all time points, right? The same goes with numerous possible ages, like 27, 28, whatnot, right? So these things are constant. They never change across time. And the other part of the state are variables. In this example is age. So variables can change across time. This, this is briefly kind of what the state contains. It contains constants and variables, right? And now when we write a, a formula, right, we want to interpret some statement about time, uh, it's, it's good to, to say what the mental model is and how you evaluate those things. So here is a different example. We have temperature, right? So we have states, and our state contains constant is some temperature, and the variable is the temperature in this state, right? So time could be days in this case. So we did not specify in what units the time is measured. It's some discrete unit. Right, and we want to, to, to kind of see is this property here, which says eventually always the temperature is at least 11 degrees. Right, so we have some property. And in order to see whether this is true for this trace, so this is a trace, right? We, we need to see whether this is true. What we do? We start evaluating the, the truth of the subformulas or the parts of this sentence across the states. And for example, the, the kind of the innermost part is temperature is at least 11 degrees, right? So now we just see at which states this statement is true, right? Within each statement, we are kind of almost like a classical logic, but not really, right? And here we can see the temperature is 11 degrees in the first state in the third state, and the last two states here. So time can continue on forever, right? Assume the temperature remains at least 11 degrees forward, right? So this is where this part of our statement holds true. Now, in order to see in which states the always at least 11 degrees holds true, uh, we need to look at the sub formula and see whether it always holds. Right, so always means that maybe better term for this is henceforth, right? So we can ask the question, is it always the case that temperature is at least 11 degrees in the initial state? And it's not true because in the subsequent state, the temperature is 10 degrees. It's no longer at least 11, right? So it's not always the case that the temperature is at least 11 degrees in the initial state. It's also not always the case that it's in all these states until the temperature stabilizes or let's say goes below 11 degrees forever. So from this point onwards, this part of the formula will evaluate to true, right? So basically say it's always the case the temperature is at least 11 degrees. And now the final kind of temporal operator we're looking at here is eventually the case that always the temperature is at least 11 degrees and eventually is true in a given state if there is a future state where the sub sentence that you're evaluating is true right so in which states is the full sentence true can somebody just guess every state everything yes because no matter which state i evaluate this uh, this formula here, there is always a future state where it's always the case that the temperature is at least 11 degrees, and this yellow line tells you in which states the formula is. Right. So it's all this. I guess I don't understand the meaning of that future state because how do you know if it's true or not? Because there's the heat death of the universe. <laughs> where the temperature will not be. <laughs> so, 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 so this is just an example. It's an example where there is no heat that time continues. No, but I'm saying we don't know if there's going to be a heat death or not. So how? Uh, do we okay, know? okay, you're absolutely correct. So, for this sentence, as humans, we cannot evaluate it. But avoiding Leibniz properties, verification problem is difficult. Right? Yes. More questions? Okay. Good. So let's do a small quiz, right, just to, to see how this temporal logic works, right? And here we, 
uh, this is very unfortunate because this should be a circle. I don't know why this is a square. <laughs> so we have two squares, which is very unfortunate. It's an unprintable character, yes. Yes, these ones don't have it. Anyway. Bold. It's, bold. it's the bold square, right? So we use the small square to say always. The, how do you say the diamond? To say eventually. And the bold square to use next. Something is true in the next step. So what does this sentence say, right? You have two formulas or two predicates, P and Q. And this thing says P implies that eventually Q, right? This is what it says. So how do you interpret this informally? This, what do you understand from this? OK, let, let me help you. Uh, if, 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 if there's P, there will eventually Q will happen. Yes. If there's P. Yes. So, so yes, I, I put this example just to emphasize something. When we are evaluating a formula, we are evaluating it always in the initial state. Right? So there is a slight kind of something in this subscript written tiny. We are always evaluating a formula in the initial state, so you're almost, yes, uh, uh, right? Uh, we evaluate this in the initial state. Is if initially P is true, then in some future moment, or the current moment, actually, eventually it's not strict, but it's or the current moment, Q holds. Right? And what you said, you, we can formalize with, it's always the case, if P holds, eventually Q will hold. Right? So no matter whether it's initial state or non-initial state, for every state, if this holds. Right? Okay, so what about this one? Always eventually P. They just get some alternative description of this formula. Yes? It's impossible for P to never happen? That's yes, you can play with uh, the Morgan's laws, yes, yes. This is alternative description, it's valid. Another one, can you come up with another one? Yes? P is true infinitely often. Exactly, yes. So you can interpret this, because we have kind of time running to infinity, you say P, is true infinitely often, meaning that it's always the case that eventually P holds, but if P eventually does not hold, in some future state it also must eventually hold, so this will repeat infinitely often. Right? And what about this one, if we swap? Eventually always P holds, yes. Well, yeah, what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, so this. Okay, I just wanted some, some more elaborate description, absolutely. Yes, if, if you just read, phrase out, phrase, phrase kind of spell out well, what is written, it, it, it is what it is. This basically says that eventually P stabilizes. Kind of from certain moment onwards, P will always go. Right? This is all it says. Great. Well, we have three more. So, so we got into this one now. So, what does it say? Yes. From any state that P is true, Q is true, that state and every state after. In every state after. Yeah. And why is this the case? This is true, you're correct, yeah. yes. Well, because the always Q on the right hand side of the unit. This is the bold square which is, which oh. is next. Oh, next, sorry. <laughs> yes, oh, yes. Okay. Sorry, so we have technical issue with the thoughts, yes, yes. Yeah. But it's true, actually, what you said, right? So if you interpret this next as next, right? It's always the case, right, that if P holds, then in the next case, Q will hold, right? Never, never P. Sorry? P will never be true. Why, why P will never be true? Because then the next state would be Q and... They are not mutually exclusive. Ah, okay, got They're it. not mutually yeah. exclusive, they're not. So then right? just P is always followed by Q. Right? Yes, P is always followed by Q, this is it, right? And now you have what you said, right, is if P holds, afterwards, onwards, until infinity, Q will hold. Right. Good, so, so these are the more simple ones, one last. Right, and we move on. <laughs> I don't know why I put so many, but... Okay, so this one is more complex. Right? It says it's always the case. There is some constant N, such that in this case, the clock equals N, and in the next case, clock equals N plus 1. Yes, 
the clock always has a value, and the next step is going to increment by one. Yes, the clock always increments by one. Okay, this is this is all these properties sets. I just wanted so this is kind of full temporal logic, right? You can write many complex formulas and statements in full temporal logic. Clock yeah. always clicks or ticks by one increment. This is, is what this correct? Saying. Because the clock actually does the time. Yes, the clock. It depends on computer clock if you count digital time, clock. digital clock, or some <laughs> Unix timestamp, or whatever it is. But it again the goes to zero, zero. It could be modular edition. Depends on the edition. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a wrap around, sorry. Okay, so for, 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 for standard clock, it doesn't work. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. So now, how all this uh, applies to smart contracts, right? So what we do here. Uh, we need to fix what time means first, first and foremost. And what we do is we do the following: we have world states, and the world states are the states of the whole blockchain in between <coughs> transactions, right? So whenever you execute things on blockchain, you always wrap the thing inside the transaction. And our state will be the world state of the blockchain, and time increment means the execution of a single transaction, right? This is what we do, and. We don't support the full temporal logic. We support just a fragment of it, which is called canonical safety fragment, but I'll not go in details. And roughly it looks like this. You always, your, your formulas look uh, of this form. Always P, where P is some formula of the following shape. So you have logical conjunctions, P and Q. You have disjunction, P or Q. You have implication, P implies Q. You have this very interesting operator, which is temporal operator, once p, which means that once in the past p was holding. This is the time reversal of the eventual operator. So we have eventual meaning in future moment p will hold. This means that in the past p was holding, or the current state. Yes. At least once. Or at least exactly once. At least that. once. Exactly. So it's not exactly once, but at least once. So in some past state. With all. Right. This is what we do. And finally, whenever you have some expression, you can refer to the previous value of this expression. So this is similar to the next operator. So in the previous state, the value of this expression was something. Right? So here you refer to the previous value of the expression. These are the basic things. By the way, what happens in the initial state where there is no previous state? What do you think? So when there was no initial state, just for simplicity, we take the previous value with the current value in the initial state. Just remember this. I mean, sometimes it's no. Repeated a bunch. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Okay. And now we have some Ethereum-specific things because we are, after all, doing things on Ethereum. So one thing is we support sum of mappings, right? So if balances is a mapping inside, like inside a token contract, we we can refer to the sum of all these things. Uh, function returns the, the name of the function which is called in this transaction, the top level function. Right? So we have nested calls, we kind of abstract these nested calls away. We, we can refer only to the top level transaction, the function in the top level transaction. Uh, we can refer to function names, so this is the syntax for referring to a function name. And we can also refer to arguments of functions. So syntax is a little bit improvised. We are going to improve it in the future. So this is the zeroth argument of the claim refer function. And here what you do is you do canonical name of the function. So this is the name of the counter, name of the function, and here you need to put the signature of the function with the addresses, right? And this is what happens. Yes. Okay, I'll just uh, shout. Can you shout? So so we don't support specification of loop invariance. So all we do we speci specify let's call it transaction invariance, something that holds across transactions. What if we have non-trivial loops in the country? So in some cases we can rewrite them rewrite them without loops, but uh, if you have non-trivial loops we unfortunately don't support it. Yes. Yes. So no negation for the formulas or is that Oh, good. I have forgot it. Yes, there is also negation. So, yes. 
aqua field inundation. Yes, sir. So uh, maybe I missed this, but you said earlier that you know you evaluate a formula always in the initial state in classical temporal logic. Yes. So what's is, is the semantics different now? And we, we no, keep... it's the same. It's just that we support formulas of the shape always p, right? That, that's for the for the operators once and previous. If we're always evaluating in the initial state. Uh, no, no. So, so you evaluate, evaluate the top level of the formula in the initial state, right? Yeah. But it could happen that when you say always, this means that the inner part of the formula needs to be evaluated in all states. Right. right. So in the, this is the semantics of the always operator. So from formula to subformula, you change the point at which you evaluate. Right. Depending on the semantics of the temporal operators. You change the point at what? At which you evaluate the, the same formula, right? So always changes the point at which you evaluate. You evaluate in all points from the current point onwards. Uh, that's the idea. Yes. So you evaluate formulas always, basically, in all states. Okay. Good. So okay. now let's move on to that. Small quick question mark <coughs> next on that uh, box on the on the left. You have once and previous. There's no next. There is no next. We don't support it. Yes, we're somewhat limited. Yes. But many things that you can express with next actually you can express in this way. Just you need to massage your formula. Not everything that. Okay, but you do you have negation there? That was just a I forgot. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. There is negation. Yes, we don't uh, rob people with negation. Yes. So if you have negation and always, don't you also have eventually? Uh, we require always to be the top level, right? And so never again. Yes, you cannot negate. Yeah, never again. Yes. Okay. This is always p, and p is given by this syntax plus negation. So you always have to have always. You always have to have always. So you can write, it, you can write it down in the formula, or is it? Implicit. Sorry? Do you even write it down? Yes, we even write it down in the formula, so it's explicit. Okay. Yes. So yes, it's basically what you can specify is contract invariance, right? Contract invariance, exactly. You yeah. can say it this way. Yes. But you also can refer to the past, right? So that's that's the kind of cool thing. So uh, I'm just curious, um, why not next? I mean is there I'm not familiar with the yeah. verification technology, so is there a technical reason why next is more difficult than previous? So for verification, it's, it's uh, slightly more difficult. Yes. Okay. Yes. So you need to, to do some gymnastics. Okay. And when you add, eventually it becomes more difficult, way more difficult. Okay. Yes. Because once you always look finite number of steps in the past, but because in the past time is limited, is bounded. But in the future it's unbounded. And when you add, eventually uh, things become very, okay. very infinite. Right. That's. Okay. That's the thing. Good. How much time do we have? 25 minutes. Okay, so maybe we we'll just go quickly over the exercises. So, now it's time to formalize what we did. And just to load balance our verifier, we have two servers in which you can run Varex. There is graphic user interface. Let's say this part of the room uses Varex 1 and the other part of the room uses Varex 2. Yes, can we do it like this? Because the server is uh, powerful, but verification is difficult. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, I forgot the docs actually. Let me just quickly refresh this. Put the, the link to the, the docs. So, this is the option. Sorry, uh, just yes. general. Just, is Varex an online tool only or is it downloadable? At, at the moment, it's online tool only. We hope to open source it in the future. I'll show Yes. Okay, so there are two servers left part of the room, left part of the room. And for Varex index, you can click this link and check out the links. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
this. Okay, so so if you open if you open the links, you see this this kind of interface to Varex. On the left, what you have is a list of contracts plus specifications. So we preloaded Varex with a couple of contracts, and currently we focus on the ERC20 and ERC uh, sorry and crowd sales, Right, so we have two contracts which we focus on. And the entries and the suffix with solution are the solutions to those exercises. Right? We have three extra exercises which you can do, but maybe, not maybe, there will be no time for this today. Uh, they have no solutions, so you need to kind of think a little bit more on that about it. Okay, good. Yes? Uh, well, no, it's a general question. So well, I'm, just, I'm wondering, how do you do these state predicates? It's not like the state predicate success. Or can I define one as a user, for instance? As a user? Okay, let like me maybe, maybe yes. No, 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 not solution. Uh, let me use. Uh, sorry. No. <coughs> so, you give a list of formulas. Later we'll talk about the remaining formulas, but what's important is the first formula. So, the first formula gives your property. And it has this form, always, and then some form. Right? So whenever you're specifying something. And then you have uh, a table which gives you more details, the syntax. And for example, you can refer to contract fields using contract dot fields. Right? So you can refer to the contract state this way. I forgot some of the syntax details. Right? Also, you can refer to message sender, you can refer to the current time, the time in this world state. I forgot the block. Yes. So, let's see. Uh, yeah, so I guess I don't see any of the state predicates documented. State predicates? Uh, <laughs> it's some, are they saying so? I, I, it's, it's like it will try uh, like actual you know, it's, it's double quality. Yeah, it's yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It's like uh, oh, so yeah. Well, it's 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 Okay, let me just give you a, a short demonstration about the fir first property. I right? total supply always equals the sum of balances. So. Okay, so yes, Peter will write the first property, right? This one is simple one. Say always. Token underscore balances. It's always the case that the sum of balances equals the total supply. Yes, this is it. And if you go scroll down, there is a verify. Verification takes some time. You see that the property, the first one is queued, which means it's a pending state. It's not known whether it verifies or not. And the other problem is fail to verify. So you need to verification takes some time. So you cannot. It's not uh, how to say a tool where you get immediate feedback. It just verification takes some time. Yes. Why does it take so long? Uh, it takes so long because we analyzed the bytecode level. You're absolutely right. And uh, the very short code that you 
heard about yesterday, does it very so, very so, it's a tool from Microsoft, uh, it verifies it on the syntax, abstract syntax, which is kind of the high level semantics. Uh, but, and then it can be faster. Um, so you said you support some drag and uh, does that just mean some opcodes aren't supported? Or what does that mean? Some, somewhere before, I think, well, maybe it was in your paper, I was reading it, but that's uh, yes, something yes. implied there was. Delegate only. call, for example, is unsupported. Yes. So there's just some opcodes that are unsupported. Some opcodes are unsupported. Yes. Like when you have delegate call, it's very easy to break any property. And we just say it does not